If we look at the general population of America today, ask yourself, are they financially free? How are they doing? The ones that are saving and getting the max match in their 401ks, are they financially free? How about financial advisors? Are they financially free? They're not. So why would we do the same old crap that they've been doing for years, decades, and it hasn't worked? Welcome to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association, providing benefits and services to real estate investors and rental property owners for over 48 years. With your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. This episode is sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single-family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. And RCB & Associates, helping real estate investors and small business owners navigate the complex world of health insurance and Medicare benefits at rcbassociatesllc.com. Hello and welcome to episode 289. Have you ever tried talking to your financial advisor about investing in real estate? What did they have to say? Did they bring up the risks and performance compared to investing in stocks, mutual funds, and bonds? Or did they encourage you to invest in real estate and build passive income? Well, if you're talking with a traditional mainstream financial advisor, it's more likely that they steered you away from real estate into mutual funds or stocks. And my guest today believes that traditional mainstream financial advice is broken And he should know because he used to be a financial advisor and stock coach. Chris Miles is now a cash flow expert for real estate investors and anti-financial advisor. He uses his company Money Ripples to expose the popular myths around money that have kept so many real estate investors from enjoying financial freedom and peace of mind. Chris, welcome to the show. Hey, pleasure to be here. You used to be a financial advisor. I would love your glimpse into that world and why they always push you towards stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. So I want to go there, but first tell us a little bit about yourself, how you were able to transition out of that and into the world of real estate. I got into the the whole, real, the really the traditional mainstream financial advisor world accidentally almost. You know, my original intent was to go into business consulting, right? So I figured if I was in college doing business consulting, if I were going to do that, I should get real life business experience before I got out of college. So I actually took a sabbatical from college and decided, hey, let's let's try this out. And so trying to be an entrepreneur, the first thing that came up was being a financial advisor, not knowing they just take anybody off the street, right? They just take anybody. If you can pass a test and you have a heartbeat, good, congratulations, you know, and I guess a clean record. If you got a clean, you know, uh, record passed, that helps too. But, um, you know, it was interesting because as I went down that path, you know, this is back in the white, you know, the, you know, right after 9-11 is when I got in. And it was fascinating because I really liked it. I really liked being my own boss and being an entrepreneur. So I stayed dropped out of college, didn't go back. And I was that financial advisor for about four years. And uh, which in the financial advisor world is, is an old guy, you know, <laughs> because most never make it one or two years. Um, but I'll tell you, like after those four years, it was interesting because I started to open my eyes to seeing, you know, the truth, right? Because I'm the kind of guy that likes evidence. I like to know that things work, you know? And I realized that I inherited a lot of clients that had financial advisors during the 1990s and into the 2000s. Uh, it was very, it was very ironic that many of those people I'd call up and say, oh, is that financial advisor dead? Or are they in jail? I hope so. I'm like, wow, okay. <laughs> no, either they quit or my, they might've passed away, but most of them had quit by that point. And uh, they're just like, oh, man, I'm so mad because I lost so much money in Y2K and you know, all this kind of stuff, right? Well, I started to see their, their actual results. And many of them even had financial advisors back from the 80s. But still, they didn't have a lot of money. You know, they weren't really financially free. And, but at the same time, I didn't quite equate it. You know, like, you know, I started to see like what the real returns of the stock market were. Like we used to teach back in the day that you would average at least 10 to 12% in the stock market, Right. Well, that's the average, but that's not the actual yield. Because once you have a negative year, the average and the actual returns differ, right? Because of mathematics. Well, when I started to realize that on a, in a good 30-year period, like right now, for example, we've had 12 up years, right? In a good 30-year period, the market's only averaged just over 8% a year. That's the actual yield before fees and before taxes. So when I started to put in real numbers, right? When I put in like 8%, you know, if you even got 8%, that was a pretty good thing. You know, usually you'd be lucky to get six or seven, but I put in like 8%. And then I put in the real inflation rates, not the one the government tells you, but the real inflation rates that are much higher. I started to realize this is depressing. 
it's really hard for people to save. I, I realized early on that the whole save 10% for 40 years, you should be financially free was bogus. Like the numbers did not pan out. Even saving 20% of your income didn't work. In fact, I even recently, I ran the numbers. I said, hey, if someone wants to live a 60,000 a year lifestyle, not a rich lifestyle, barely middle class, 60,000 a year lifestyle, if you want to retire in 20 years, you would have to save about 10,000, well, about 8,300 bucks a month or almost 100 grand a year to actually live on a 60,000 a year lifestyle, right? That's not good. And so uh, four years in, I, I talked to a guy that actually had trained to be a financial advisor, but left to go do real estate investing. And he told me, he, he said, uh, hey, Chris, man, life is awesome. You know, because I'm, I'm wishing him like a Merry Christmas, Happy New Year at the end of 2005, right? He's like, man, things are awesome right now. Uh, my dad and I partnered up in some real estate deals in the last four months. We've, we've now doubled his income as a professor at the local university. And I, of course, I said, come on, that's too good to be true, right? You know, I'm sure you hear that kind of stuff all the time, right? It's too good to be true, Brian. Like, that's, it just can't be that good. Like, besides, real estate only goes up 3% a year. That's the kind of stuff I was telling him, right? And he's like, no, man, like, it's actually working. And so we got this debate about what's better, stocks or real estate. And finally, after a minute or two, he just said, Chris, stop. Listen, let me ask you a question here. How many of your clients are actually financially free where they don't worry about money? Not the ones that are retired that are worrying about money, but not worrying about money. And I thought about even the retired ones. I said, well, they're watching CNN. So they got to be worried about money because everybody fears everything when you watch CNN, right? So, you know, everybody. I'm like, well, none of them. None of them are financially free. He said, well, great job, Chris. Well, how about this? How many of you guys as financial advisors? Because if anybody has it figured out, it should be you guys. So how many of you are financially free, not off the commissions that you're earning, but actually doing these mutual fund investments? How many of you are financially free off of those investments alone? And I thought about it. And I said, well, one, maybe none. And I found out that one guy that was in my mind, I found out later he wasn't either. So none of the financial advisors, including the ones that have been financial advisors since the, the mid to late 70s, weren't financially free themselves, right? And in this real estate world, it's a very different, different game, right? We know lots of people, including myself, that are actually financially independent, regardless of stock markets and all that junk, you know? And, that, and that's where I said, okay, fine. Well, tell me, you know, tell me what the answer is. He's like, I'm not going to tell you the answer because I don't think you're open to it. You just got done arguing with me. And I said, listen, you got me to admit I'm wrong, okay? Like, I can see truth here. Give me something, at least give me something more to, to go deeper. He's like, listen, all right, if you're really serious, go get this book by Robert Kiyosaki called Who Took My Money? It's a lesser known rich dad book. Um, it, to sum it up, mutual funds suck. Okay, so that's pretty much it. Um, saved you three hours audio book right there. <laughs> he just explains why in more depth. Um, and, then, and then, of course, he says, listen to this radio show because it's pre-podcast. You know, listen to this AM radio show with these two real estate investors. And so, you know, I'm in Utah. So I was listening to the radio show when, you know, right after the new year when they came back in their season and I got hooked. And, and the, here's the crazy thing. They rarely ever talked about strategy, ever. They talked mostly just about general financial principles. They talked a lot about founding fathers and principles that they taught of prosperity that really leaked into everything else, into business, real estate, didn't matter, right? They were teaching more of the principle stuff, the mindset stuff than they ever were the strategy. And I'll tell you, after a couple of months, I realized, you know, it was March of 06, I couldn't keep teaching this anymore and stay in integrity. I knew differently. I knew that this stuff didn't work in the traditional mainstream world. Like it didn't matter how you saved. It was nearly impossible to be financially free. So I left. I said, I'll never teach about money again. I will just be a mortgage broker, you know, and I'll, and I'll teach ballroom dancing on the side. So little known fact, I'm one of the, I was, used to be one of the nation's top amateur ballroom dancers. Um, so I was going to do that at the local university a little bit on the side there. And so I did that. But of course, I needed, I, I just, it drove me nuts that these guys, some of them in their 20s and 30s that were financially independent, it drove me nuts they knew things that I didn't know. So, uh, so I started to try to learn from these guys, you know, and it wasn't just real estate stuff. It was even business things that, you know, ended up applying. I was like, whoa, I can create passive income here too. And the next thing I know, like by that later that summer, I was financially independent at 28 years old, almost 29. And, uh, and it got to this point of, all right, now what do I do with my life? And uh, it wasn't until beginning of 2007, I realized, okay, let's, I start partnering up with some guys and we created a company to help people get out of the rat race and, and that sort of thing. And, and really since then, I, I mean, really kind of a little bit in 06 too, but for the most part, since 2007, I've been teaching people how to 
do the opposite, right? To do something different. Traditional financial advice. What, what is it? Basically, stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. Is that yeah. what what it is? Yeah, it's 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 really like Mexican food if you think about it, right? Like you can go to a Mexican restaurant and they have all these different things from chimichangas, enchiladas, tacos, burritos, you know, tort- you know, you name it, right? But if you get down to the ingredients, they're all the same ingredients, right? They're all tortillas, meat, rice, beans, you know, lettuce, tomatoes, guacamole, salsa, whatever, right? It's all the same ingredients, just packaged differently. And that's really the financial advisor world. It's just Mexican food of the financial world because it's really just dumbed down to mutual funds and insurances. That's it, right? It's it's purely it. I mean, even annuities, they have that's from an insurance company that's still either with mutual funds or it's index funds or just fixed, you know? There's nothing special if you really think about what they offer. So if someone goes to their financial advisor, and to be clear, we're not telling them to pull all their money out of their stocks, bonds, and mutual right. funds and take it away from their financial advisor. But if they do go to their financial advisor and say, hey, I'd like to start investing in real estate, mm-hmm. can you help me with that? What is the answer they're going to get? Every 100% of the time, no. And in fact, in some cases, now some might you know be honest and say, "Hey, that's a good way to diversify, right?" They always say, "Diversify your portfolio." You know, hopefully, I diversify into their stuff, which is not diversified. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, they're not going to tell you. They might tell you, "Yeah, you could do that on the side, but you should have your money here with me, right?" Because they know they're going to lose commissions. And and trust me, I've had real estate guys say, "Is there any way we can comp them?" I was like, "Unless you've got your own security fund in, in your real estate." These financial advisors cannot legally recommend to your funds or even to buy a real estate property. You know, and in fact, if they're if they're securities licensed where they sell you mutual funds or stocks, right? If they have a series six or a series seven, they can't even tell you to go buy those things. In fact, they're supposed to even kind of tell you to go away from them, right? Um, they're supposed to tell you just to only buy stocks or only mutual funds. Whatever it is they sell you, that's what they're going to tell you. Um, and the truth is that that's horrible. Because let's look at evidence. Again, again, I love looking at evidence. Look at the people that maybe in your own life, you know, that are not just they've made it over that million dollar mark, right? Because people can save their way to over a million bucks. But you won't often see people save their way to multi-millions of dollars or tens of millions of dollars. That only happens. Even if people have stocks and, and, and mutual funds, it's not that that gets them there. It's generally either one, they got an amazing business or they sold it for tens of millions of dollars or two, they have real estate and that's where they built the real wealth. And then just saying, yeah, I've got stocks and mutual funds over here because that's what my financial advisor will let me have, right? The truth is you should be the boss of your own money. You shouldn't have a financial advisor telling you what to do because let's be honest, most financial advisors make less money than you and I do. <laughs> so why are we listening to people that are broke, that are just salesmen in suits? And I know I was there for four years. I was told, I was taught the whole time, confu- pretty much to the point of confusing people so that they just trust you with their money. Just tell them it's too complex, too pomp- complicated. You should diversify. You should set it and forget it. Just put it away forever, which is exactly what the financial institutions want you to do so that they make their guaranteed charges. And of course, the financial advisor makes their guaranteed commissions too, and it goes on forever. And so we've bought into this myth that somehow a financial advisor is the best way to go. And the truth is you can do much better going away from that in being completely out of the stock market, even if you want it to be, you don't, we're not, again, we're not giving advice. I'm just telling you there's way more proof of success in the real estate game than there ever has been in the mutual fund game. You said something very key in there that that I want to repeat. And that is if, if you have a licensed financial advisor, they're not even allowed to endorse real estate or, or say, yes, this is a viable way to diversify. Like that yeah. goes against what the, the, the rules of being a licensed financial advisor is. Yeah. If you look at like with the financial institutions who lobby to Wall Street or it's not, well, they lobby to Wall Street too, but they, they lobby to, to Capitol Hill, right? Um, and you look at the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, right? They're all in bed together this, you know, financially. If you look at it, they got such a tight noose around financial advisors that they're stuck. They cannot give you advice outside of their little world. And, and in fact, I remember being securities licensed myself up until 2005, right? About right before 2006, I dropped my securities license. And, uh, and I remember like even to try to buy a real estate property, if you want to do anything with a real estate business or a deal or anything, even a side business, you had to report it to your compliance officers, right? You had to report it to them and then they would tell you whether you could do it or not. In fact, that's the reason why I had to quit 
my drop my securities license because when I started stock coaching people, right, teaching them how to trade their own stocks and options, and get this, I wasn't even telling them which stocks to buy. I was just telling them, here's how to read charts, here's how to do analysis, so you can make up your own decisions, right? And still, even then, they gave me the choice. I said, listen, either you can keep your license and stay here, or you have to drop your license and you can do that on the side. And I said, I'm dropping my license. <laughs> and it was the most liberating thing ever to get rid of that securities license because I couldn't even send an email and say, hey, the barbecue this weekend, I guarantee it's going to be a good time. Because if I use the word guarantee, they flag it, sends it up there, and then I have to report to them, tell them why I use the word guarantee in an email to a potential client. So it's just stupid world that, that you're in. And yeah, again, your financial advisor, as well-intentioned as they are, they got their hands tied. They, they have no freedom to tell you what really works. They can only tell you what I've already told you has been proven not to work. Did I hear you say that if you as a financial advisor wanted to buy, invest in real estate yourself, you'd have to get approval for that? Yeah, depending on the type of real estate you're buying. Now, buying your own house, you don't have to report anything, right? But if you start doing things more in the rental game or you try to especially go the active path, oh my God, or do a syndication even, even if it's a passive one, you try to do syndication, you have to report that. And they have the, the, the ability to tell you, no, you cannot, right? So they can say, nope, that's outside. Clearly, you cannot do that with your license. So they actually dictate what even the financial advisors can, can invest in. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about green property management. Not only do they manage everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area, they also manage my entire portfolio. So I can tell you from personal experience that their unique flat fee management style is worth a closer look. If you feel that your property isn't operating to its fullest potential, then green property management can help you take a holistic approach that will save you money, eliminate your headaches, and increase your net income. And if you're a property property manager interested in applying green property management's model, give them a call at 1-866-95-GREEN or visit them on the web at greenpropertymgt.com. If you're thinking of leaving your W-2 job and becoming a full-time real estate investor, one of the greatest costs you must consider is healthcare for you and your family. When I made this transition myself, I found the whole healthcare insurance process to be confusing and frustrating. That's why I'm glad I met Chad Creasy at RCB and Associates. Chad is a professional health insurance agent who helps real estate investors and small business owners understand and choose their best healthcare options. And best of all, his services are covered by the the insurance company and won't cost you a dime. If you live in Michigan and are expecting a change in your health care insurance coverage for any reason or losing employer coverage or transitioning into Medicare, then you owe it to yourself to contact Chad Creasy at RCB Associates LLC.com. You left that behind. Yep. What direction did you go in? So you, you said, nope, I'm not going to follow those rules anymore. I'm going to go my own way. What did that look like? Yeah, I was a little lost, you know. Um, you know, like I said, I was just doing, being a mortgage broker more. I was doing that a little bit more, um, and I was still doing the stock coaching. I was still doing that as well, and uh, and then teaching the ballroom dancing, right? Um, but uh, I remember as I was starting to find out from these guys, like what to do, right? Like how do I, you know, do it different, and uh, and how do I create freedom for myself? I remember one of the guys asked me. He said, "Hey, listen. So, do you like doing mortgages?" And I said, "Well." I like getting people the results, but honestly, I hate paperwork. I hate dealing with all the hassle there and the underwriting and hating that people will call me 24 hours after I just submitted it, tell them, hey, give me two or three weeks before I have an update. And then they call 24 hours later saying, hey, is there an update, right? Like that kind of stuff, I just couldn't stand. He said, well, why don't you find somebody who does like doing that? And I thought, well, that's weird. Um, I never considered that, you know, that I could actually have somebody I can partner with on this. And so- I said, Are, is there a guy like that, that exists? He says, I guarantee it. Go to your own broker and find out who's more the nerd, right? And uh, and I found a guy who loved the paperwork, wasn't the most you know social guy, but he was a nice guy, right? So he wasn't, you know, he had at least some bedside manner. And I and I would just teach the people, and especially in this time, I started teaching them differently. I was like, hey, do you realize this is 2006, right? So everything's booming with just like it is now with, with appreciation. I said, do you realize you got equity in your home? You can get that equity out and go and invest it and make cash flow off that and essentially pay off your mortgage for you, right? Or have extra passive income for whatever purpose. And they're like, well, that's awesome. Cool. Well, how do I do that? I was like, great. Let's do a cash out refinance mortgage. Here's my guy, Clark. Talk to him and he'll get you set up. You know, he'll get the paperwork started. So he didn't have to do any selling. 
but at the same time, I'd have to do any paperwork. And a month or so later, I get this check for like a thousand or 2000 bucks. And I thought, well, that was easy. I spent a half an hour and an hour, you know? And it was interesting because although I told people I quit, people still kept asking me questions and they noticed that something was changing in me. There was something different, a different almost energy or light because, you know, going from that, you know, that little confined financial advisor mindset, right? Going from that to expanding and just blowing the roof off to seeing what's possible. I mean, even hard money lending, I was like, wait, you can make 20, 30% hard money. No way. Like that's, that seems crazy, you know? And at that time that was way, it was way more doable. Now I get skeptical of people trying to pay 20 or 30% on hard money loans, but still it can happen, you know, if with the right deal. So anyways, like just that blew the lid off my head. Right. And so because of that, people were just coming to me saying, I feel like, you know, something I was like, well, here's what I'm learning, but I don't know everything, you know? And I would just teach them a little bit and they're like, cool, how do I do that? And so it, I kind of almost became, even though I try to get out of the financial world, people kept trying to pull me back in. And the more money I ended up making outside of doing the traditional stuff, the more people were just like, I just feel like I need to talk to you, right? Like I didn't have to, in fact, I didn't even try to promote myself. I actually was, when people would ask me, what do I do with my time in 2006? I would say, uh, I sell drugs. You know, just to either one buy time or two to get them to laugh and get off my back and not ask me more questions because I couldn't describe what I was doing. All right. I was, I was kind of being an investor, but I was kind of a business owner, but I was just somewhere in the middle. And, uh, but that was the cool thing is that was just, it created this, this whole new world of possibility. And, and eventually it just kind of guided me to that path because every time I try to retire or every time I'm, you know, financially independent, that's the time that everybody wants you to, to tell them how to do it. Right. So, uh, and I, of course I'm a teacher at heart. So naturally I just find myself teaching and, and being in that, that role. It sounded like people were coming to you for financial advice. When, when did that switch into real estate? Pretty much in 2006. I mean, more so there, right? Um, you know, I, I was telling them, Hey, I don't trust the stock market. I think it's bogus. Um, and, and that was right before it started crashing into the recession anyways. Right now with the real estate side, I didn't really know much myself, you know? So I'm more like, hey, go listen to this radio show, like the one I was listening to at that time. You know, I was kind of referring out. But what was the radio show, by the way? Uh, it was just a small radio show. It, it discontinued in 2007 or 2008. Um, in fact, one of the partners of that radio show died in 2006 that summer. Um, about the same time I became financially independent, he died in a plane wreck. Mm. So, uh, so it kind of you know went from there. So they're they're not even around anymore. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, it was it was you know it was just that thing that they were just teaching good principles and. And it got my start. And, uh, and then, of course, I got my own experience, good and bad, you know, before the recession. I mean, I was doing everything right up until my ego got in the way, right? Uh, because, uh, you know, you know I, I was focusing on cash flow. Like, I realized that cash flow was the main thing that financial advisors don't teach because they always teach you how to accumulate and grow your money and then live on less than the interest, Right. So, I mean, it used to be that there was the 4% rule. Like you save up mutual funds. If you save up a million bucks, you live on 4% or 40,000 a year. But even when I was a financial advisor, we started realizing 4% was too aggressive. You know, now maybe 2 or 3% is a better number to use, not 4. 4 is so outdated. It drives me nuts that there's people out there thinking that still works. So when I tell people, even if it's 3%, you have a million dollars. You finally saved up to only live on 30,000 a year. You're living below the poverty line. But if I have that same million bucks, and even if I only make 10% passively, right? Instead of 30,000 a year, I'm making 100,000 a year with that same million dollars. And of course, if I make better returns anyways than the stock market, which only averages maybe 7 or 8%, and that's before fees and taxes, and I can do real estate where I often don't have to pay any taxes because all my gains are offset by depreciation and everything else, and I'm making at least double-digit returns, it's, it's just dramatically different how your life can be. So, so again, kind of coming back to, you know, 2006 and going into 07, right? I was focused on the cash flow part, which did, you know, helped everything work. The thing I did wrong was that I started getting greedy, right? And we're seeing this in today's market too, because in today's market, we see a lot of people getting extra greedy. They're saying, hey, look at the appreciation. I'm going to buy bigger stuff, right? Well, I was focusing on appreciation too. I said, well, if I have a hundred thousand house that appreciates 10%, that's 10 grand. But a $500,000 house at 10% is 50,000. So let's go big, which is the wrong thing to do right before the recession hit. And you know, I found myself over a million dollars in debt that I had to dig myself out of that hole. It took several years, by the way. It took me from you know, 2008 till about 2016 before I was financially independent again, the second time. So when you talk about how, to, how I retired twice, 
you shouldn't have to retire twice. <laughs> that means I screwed up, right? But, uh, but I'll tell you that that wisdom I gained from being stupid in my late 20s to early 30s, you know, really carried with me into my 30s and in, into my 40s now where I'm much wiser than I was before. Now I like boring investments. To me, boring is sexy. I like cash flow. I like stable, predictable cash flow and income coming in. And that's how I invest today. So I know I had a lot of different points there, but you know, the point is that, you know, even then, you know, there's still a much bigger chance of success doing that, that strategy with real estate. Well, Chris, let's, let's focus on cash flow. Yeah. Uh, you know, you talked about freeing up cash flow, creating cash flow. Uh, give us your take on that. How do you free up cash flow or create cash flow? Yeah. I mean, you can only do one of two things, right? Either increase income or reduce expenses. I mean, that's the easy mathematics of it. The, the trick is, especially on the reduced expense side, because there's a lot of you know, people that saver scarcity mentality, which you can never become financially free as a saver scarce mentality, right? Um, many people think you just got to cut down expenses to nothing. Well, you can only cut them down so far until it's ridiculous. And I'll tell you, I've got so many clients that are like the Dave Ramsey poster child, right? Where they, uh, they just did everything right. They paid off all their debt. They saved up in the stock market only to find out they have zero passive income. Like I have one client right now, he's got $3 million of net worth, him and his wife, very successful in their, in their business. But again, that they have, don't have the passive income coming in that creates that freedom to step away from the business that they chose to. And so, uh, so even just in the last month, they already deployed over a million dollars of that. That's now going to create at least a hundred grand a year. Um, and then some, you know, and, and they've got more to deploy too. Um, that's the difference. So we didn't have to make them cheap. We didn't have to cut down their lifestyle at all. Although I do recommend people start tracking their money and doing things like that to uh, find more cash to use, right? Um, but don't think that being debt-free is going to do it. So in many cases, when I'm looking at a situation, some people are trying to pay off debt a certain way if they have debt. And I'll say, hey, you know what? This debt pay down, this one leave alone. In fact, we might want to refinance this debt to make it longer term, better interest rate or both so that we can reduce the payments to free up cash, right? To, again, because freedom isn't in how much you have in the bank, right? There's some freedom there, but that's not what I see. That's why I'm not what I see. I see people that have millions of dollars sitting in the bank and they're stressed, they're freaking out because their money's not making money for them. What really matters is how much more income do you have than expenses? And especially if your mainstream of income, whether it be your job or your business gets, you know, gets gone, it what gets cut, or it's no longer, if you're a business owner, you're no longer an essential business, as we heard in 2020, right? All this kind of stuff. We want to make sure we have multiple streams of income coming in to protect you. So it is one thing of trying to cut back and reduce things. You know, like I said, we can re refinance debt, we can save on money on taxes, we can do different strategies there. But ultimately, what it comes down to is, do we have now passive income as well? So it's both sides of the equation. It's not just reduce your standard of living. In fact, you can keep the standard of living, still reduce expenses by being efficient and increase your passive income at the same time. And then you get the separation of income being much higher than your expenses. And that difference, that gap is where there's real freedom. That's where it really exists. Give us some real world examples of what you just talked about. I was hoping you'd say that. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so I already mentioned the one guy, right? Uh, where they had $3 million net worth. Uh, here's a good example. This guy was also a poster child for Dave Ramsey. Um, I noticed whenever I get my Asian clients, right? Like they are like the best savers, you know, like they are amazing at saving. Um, not so good at creating passive income, you know? Um, so this one was no exception. He was down in San Diego, um, chiropractor down there doing a great work and uh, and and doing well, saving saving his money. And he was aggressively paying down his last two, two loans, which was his two mortgages, one on his house, and one on his investment property there in California. Now, every time I get somebody on the West Coast, right? If they have an investment property, almost every time I say, okay, you might want to sell it, you know, because most likely your return on equity stinks, especially if they're just, they're, they're just you know, uh, amateur real estate investors, right? Almost every time it's like, you probably just need to sell this, buy something else, go look eastward, you know, like somewhere away from California or Oregon or Washington, where the rules are horrible for tenants anyways, right? Or horrible for landlords, great for tenants. So, uh, so I looked at it and he's got like $700,000 of equity in his rental property, his cash flow, his net profit, $200 a month. I was like, listen, and, and then you've got, a, and he's got another half million of equity in his house. I said, here's what you need to do. Instead of trying to pay off your debt, because he was saying, my goal is to pay off all my debt on these two loans in, in the next six years, and that'll free up 4,500 a month. I told him, I said, listen, if you sell off this rental property, 
you have at least, even after the sales commissions on an aggressive nature, you'll have at least 600,000 you can invest. Even that 600,000 only kicked off a 10 or 11% return. That's between 60 to 65,000 a year. If you also do a cash out refinance of your home, your payment will only go up about a thousand bucks a month, but you'll have 400,000 in pocket that you can use. So between these two things, you'll have nearly a million dollars that could produce probably about 80, you know, at least you know, a net with a factor in the mortgage payment and everything else, 80 grand a year of passive income this year. Not 4,500 a month in six years, as long as everything goes according to plan, nothing interrupts your progress, right? But, uh, but instead you'll have about 80 grand a year this year. And if you keep reinvesting the 80 grand, I call it an income avalanche, right? Where you take the 80 grand, you invest it, you, know, you buy more rental properties, and then that kicks off another eight to 10,000 a year at least, right? And then you just keep doing that over and over. Next thing you know, you're over a hundred grand a year by those six years, you've already beat what you were trying to do with 4,500 a month. And of course it was hard for him because he had been such indoctrinated into, you know, buy stupid stocks and mutual funds because he had a financial advisor, right? Um, Make sure you pay off all your debts, you're debt free. And I was like, no, do the opposite. And now the hit thing is he wouldn't, he didn't want to do the cash out refinance. So I just said, listen, here's what you do. You can either just do a rate and term refinance. You'll free up a thousand, about 1100 bucks a month there. So there's freed up cash flow there or cash out refinance just up to the payment that you're already currently paying. So there's no extra, you know, uh, cost coming out of your pocket, but now you've got an extra 150 grand you can go and use or more. Actually, it's almost 200 grand you can use to go and, and invest with that to generate again, at least 20 grand a year. And, uh, and so that he was more in favor of, right? Cause again, it was for him, it, I, I can always see how somebody can maximize the situation, but it's gotta also be comfortable for the person too. So that's the thing is that there's so much you can do uh, just right there. Dave Ramsey seems to be, uh, you, you seem to have a lot of counter advice to what Dave Ramsey says. And I know a lot of our listeners are, are Dave Ramsey fans. And in fact, some, some of my highest rated episodes are when we argue about Dave Ramsey <laughs> <laughs> advice for real estate investors. What, yeah. what do you agree with with Dave Ramsey? And, and how do you nudge people to kind of get out of that, that thinking? You have to understand where Dave Ramsey is coming from, right? Because um, he's a great guy. And in fact, I hope someday to have the kind of impact he has in other people's lives too, because he's done a lot of good. Um, just to give you some perspective, I actually, you know, four years ago, married a woman who was the first certified counselor for Dave Ramsey in the state of Utah. You know, she's been to his, you know, she's been to his office. She's been out there, you know, been by his house and everything. And she knows he's a good guy too. The, the thing with him is that he's great for remedial finance, right? He is like, hey, I, I couldn't even pass my, my high school math classes. So I need to go back in college and take the remedial stuff. That's kind of what he is. He's like the very basic entry level, either for someone who doesn't know anything about money at all, or two, somebody who's a spendaholic. If somebody's a spendaholic, I've seen some of my own clients who just cannot control their spending, do his program and come out stronger. So for those people, he is amazing, right? Even the baby steps, trying to get a tiny little emergency fund, which isn't enough in his example, the thousand bucks, right? That doesn't do anything for emergencies, but hey, starting somewhere, that concept is good. You know, uh, having a, you know, start to track your money. You know, he talks about being on a budget. I call it a spending plan. I think budget sounds horrible, but a spending plan or whatever it is. Some of his first baby steps are great. It's when you try to take it to the next level, you know, well, one, how he pays off debt, I, I don't totally agree with. I actually use a different formula to pay off debt if it makes sense, right? Um, one that frees up more cash flow than what his does. Um, but uh, once you start going to like the savings component where he says, just save in your 401ks and your mutual funds, and he still thinks that the stock market averages 12%. Like it, I, have a tw- I have a Twitter tweet that he has where he says, hey, if you invest $100 a month for 40 years, you know, at 12%, you'll have, you know, just over a million dollars. Um, the funny thing is, is one, the market doesn't return 12%. Two, when he did the math, it was wrong because it was actually about nine, it was like $900,000 when I actually did the math on it. He had messed up. It, he'd have to do like 41.6 years at 100 bucks a month to hit a million dollars, right? But all that kind of stuff, he teaches like really old traditional advice, even financial advisors. Many financial advisors don't even agree with him because they're like, yeah, some of the things he teaches, that's not even true. That was a myth 20 years ago and he's still teaching it today, right? So it's not that he's a bad guy. Again, if you're trying to come from below zero, he's great to get you past zero. If you want to make become wealthy, you got to start doing the opposite stuff. And just so you know, the guy, even though he went bankrupt in real estate and he got all anti-debt, 
The funny thing is he still buys real estate today. A lot of his wealth is actually from real estate and his business. Those are his two main investments that he does today. So he doesn't go buy mutual funds necessarily. He might have a little bit, but you, you realize as you start to have more money, the wealthy don't want to buy mutual funds. They think it's a joke. People that are actually educated are like, no, mutual funds are stupid. You know, I'm going to buy at be- closest to that might be a hedge fund that's invested in different areas, not just in the stock market, which is what you're getting in the, the retail space. You mentioned you have a better way than Dave Ramsey to pay off or pay down your debt. Yeah. So uh, when I went through my little, you know, million dollar debt hole, you know, um, I went from before it became a million dollar debt hole. The reason it became that is because I was negative cash flow, right? Um, when I, it was interesting when I started that new business with some partners in 2007, they said, Hey, Chris, we want you to be focused here. This is our mission or kind of our purpose. Cut off all your income streams and focus here. Mistake number one, don't cut off your income streams, you know, especially when you have multiple streams of income. You know, two, of course, I was gambling with some of the real estate stuff, right? So I had this double whammy coming. Uh, three, we were teaching real estate investors that were going broke too. So that didn't help in our business. So I went from, you know, millionaire, like upside down millionaire, because I went in the hole like 15, 16,000 a month. So when I had dwindling savings trying to figure out what to do with it, my question was, do I invest it or do I pay off some of this debt? And I had to look at it from an ROI standpoint. And so I created a very simple index that does the same thing, which I call a cash flow index. And so what I do is I take the balance of the loan, I divide it by the minimum monthly payment, and it gives me the index number. So for instance, say that you have two loans, both $10,000 a piece. One's a car loan and one's a credit card. Naturally, credit cards got the high interest, right? Well, the car loans got the low interest. Now the credit card at that $10,000, you're paying $200 a month on that. The car loan is $500 a month. Now, if you're looking from a Dave Rand's perspective and all you had was 10,000, he would say, hands down, pay off what, Brian? Well, you'd say pay off the higher interest loan. Yeah, pay off the credit card, right? Get rid of that credit card and then take that and do the snowman method and roll all the rest to the car after that, right? Well, that's great. You would free up 200 bucks a month. I would say the opposite because if I use my index, I go for the lowest index possible. So 10,000 divided by 200 is a 50 on that credit card. 10,000 divided by 500 is a 20. Now, naturally, if you think about it, life doesn't work perfectly. And that's what I realized, right? It's always about how much extra income do you have over expenses? That buffer there is what creates more freedom and options, right? So instead of trying to pay off the credit card, I'd say, no, pay off the car. Free up the $500 a month because if something goes wrong, it's better to pay $200 a month than still be paying that $500 a month payment, right? and possibly go late on your credit and everything else. So pay off the one that's $500 a month. You can always roll that into the, and pay 700 a month towards the other credit card, pay it off within a year anyways. Um, But on top of that, you know, even if something goes wrong, you don't have to pay the 500 a month. It's optional. Um, By the way, as you pay a credit card down, the cool thing with that is, as you pay it down, the the minimum payment goes down too. So the required payment doesn't stay at 200. It actually goes, ticks downward. The, The risky thing you do, if you do Dave Ramsey's method by taking that extra 200 from the credit card, paying that off, apply it to the car loan, is that car loan payments do not decrease over time. They stay the same. They remain, even until you're to the last payment, it's still going to be 500 bucks a month. So I tell people in that scenario, if, if you were to do the opposite, don't pay extra to the car, build up in savings till you can at least pay off that and then some, right? You got to have more in savings, I realize. Whenever you liquidate savings and pay off a debt, inevitably something bad will happen. So so that's the key there. So I always go for that lowest index. And what I've found is actually people will end up paying their debts off faster and more safely than they would just aiming for the interest rate, which is kind of a, a bank's way of using you. I mean, they, they really leverage interest rates to influence you the way that they want you to. So be careful of that. One of the topics that I wanted to talk with you about is infinite banking. I'm wondering if just in, in a couple of minutes, you could give us a sense of what that is and how you apply it in your business. Yeah, infinite banking. Yes, Dave Ramsey or Susie Ormans, they hate it. And, and to some level, I agree. I actually agree with them because I remember buying, so infinite banking is just using a whole life policy, using the cash value that's in it because term insurance is just death benefit, right? But with whole life or even universal life, people will try to use it with that, which doesn't really work. But with those kind of policies, they have a cash value component. So you pay more than term insurance, but now it's going to cash. Now, the problem is that most of these people that are infinite bankers out there, most of them are doing these higher commission type of policies for you, right? So that it doesn't really make sense as a real estate investor. Uh, what I found over the years, because I first learned that in 2006 and I bought my own policy, but when the recession hit, because I had an expensive policy, I couldn't afford to keep it and I lost it. I lost 25 grand 
into insurance policies because it wasn't set up the way that I, I think it should have been. The way it should be set up is where most of your cash from day one goes into the policy as cash savings. Here's why it's awesome for a real estate investor, because unlike a Roth where you only have 6,000 or 7,000 a year, you can save into it, right? The, the life insurance has the same rules as a Roth. You know, it's, it's after tax dollars you put in, it grows tax-free, comes out tax-free. Here's the key though, is that you can use that money today. You can go invest it wherever you want. But when you, bar, when you do it, you borrow from the insurance company. You get a line of credit from them separate from your money. So your money's still in there growing compound interest tax-free, right? But you're able to borrow from it and use that to buy your real estate. So for example, you know, and, and I can borrow, like right now, I've got a line of credit against my life insurance. That's a 3.25%. The cool thing is the company's paying me 5.75%. So I'm creating arbitrage just like the bank does, right? This is how you're becoming like the bank because now I'm creating arbitrage. I'm making more money on the interest side than what I'm paying on the interest side. But now I'm also making money on my investments too. And the cash flow goes in and it starts paying down my line of credit, kind of like Velocity Bank. If you've heard people talk about that with HELOCs, right? Similar strategy, but using my life insurance instead because my life insurance is like a HELOC that pays interest. So by doing that, when it's happening, say I make a 12% cash on cash return on my rental property, right? When I use my life insurance, I usually make another three to 4% on top of it, meaning I'm making about 15 to 16% a year net on that. That's the magic. I, I, I try to use my own savings account that makes point nothing percent and gets taxed on that low point nothing percent. And, and then once you use it, it's gone. It's not earning interest anymore. Now I can have my cake and eat it too. I can have it earning interest over here and get a line of credit from the bank or the insurance company to go and let me buy my properties. And so it's it's one of those ways that really double dip. You get to you know have your cake and eat it too. You host a podcast called the Chris Miles Money Show. Do you Correct. talk about that strategy on your podcast? I do occasionally, not as often as I should, but yeah, on a rare occasion, you'll see me talk about that strategy, but I'll talk about all kinds of strategies, all kinds of real estate investing and that kind of thing on the Chris Miles Money Show. And as we wrap it up, is there any advice, any thoughts you want to leave our listeners with? Yeah. The biggest thing is one, there's hope, right? Uh, there's definitely hope and it requires some patience. You know, um, The key is this, is that if we look at the general population of America today, right? ask yourself, are they financially free? How are they doing? The ones that are saving and getting the max match in their 401ks and maxing out the 401ks, are they financially free? How about financial advisors? Are they financially free doing the same thing? They're not. So why would we do the same old crap that they've been doing for years, decades, and it hasn't worked? That's the definition of insanity, right? Is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. So I just challenge you, if you want to have any chance of freedom, do the opposite. Do what the successful people like us that are on the show do, because that is actually going to lead much better chance to freedom than doing the same old mediocre strategy with high risk and mediocre returns that has been proven to not work. Don't do that. Look outside, look at these alternative investments, just like Brian's talking about on his show here today. Chris, how would people find out more about you or get a hold of you? Yeah, I mean, obviously you can listen to the podcast, The Chris Miles Money Show, or you can go to moneyripples.com. Um, there's even my little uh, ebook on there called Beyond Rice and Beans, Seven Secrets to Free Up Cash Today. A little shot at Dave Ramsey there, of course. Um, but yeah, definitely check that out. It's there. You can download for free. Well, thank you, uh, Chris, for taking us through kind of the financial advice world, why it is it's so hard to get your financial advisor to help you understand real estate or even invest in real estate. And you know, the answer is it's because they're not supposed to. That's not what they're there for. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for explaining you know, the financial advice world and just taking us through some of these strategies to free up cash flow, infinite banking, uh, that type of thing. I really appreciate uh, this conversation that we've had today. Thank you so much. Same here, Brian. Really appreciate it. I want to thank everybody for listening to this episode. I'm your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. And you can find out more about me by going to higinvestor.com. That's H-I-G investor.com. And you can also ask questions and join us on Facebook by going to RPOA, Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast. This episode was sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. And RCB and Associates, helping real estate investors and small business owners navigate the complex world of health insurance and Medicare benefits at rcbassociatesllc.com. 
You've been listening to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association. You can find out more at rpoaonline.org. If you enjoyed this podcast, please go to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and review.